Welcome to Retire to a Life You Love with Michelle Gessner from Gessner Wealth Strategies. We inspire executives, professionals, and business savvy women to better their finances and overcome the financial stresses of life. We do all of this by giving the advice you need to identify your goals and the confidence to achieve them so you can retire to a life you love. Join us for this journey where we explore ways to win financially as Michelle draws from years of expertise and talks with today's top business minds about their wins, failures, and best practices. Welcome to Retire to a Life You Love with your host, Michelle Gessner. I'm Wendy McConnell. Hi, Michelle. How are you today? I'm good, Wendy. Today, we're going to talk to an expert. Our last episode was about avoiding common estate planning mistakes and now today, we're going to expand on that topic a little bit and touch on planning for long-term care. And we are looking very much forward to speaking with Kim Hegwood, who is the owner of Your Legacy Legal Care, which is an elder law and estate planning firm. Now, Kim focuses exclusively on elder law, estate planning, Medicaid crisis planning, probate, and guardianship. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today, Kim. Thanks, Wendy, for having me and Michelle. So I'm looking forward to this. Great. Well, Kim, before we get started, I I just we, I want to know what what made you decide to get into this field. I usually start off by telling people that um, God has uh, dictated how my practice has gone. Um, early in my practice, I was a litigator, and then I hit my what I call my proverbial brick wall. Um, couldn't do it anymore. I just, I was done. And uh, this nice little postcard came in the mail and said, if you're unhappy with your law practice, uh, with what you're doing, do you want to learn to do estate planning? And I went, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so I spent the next uh, year doing some intensive uh, study with uh, the group I was in at the time. So, you know, estate planning, no problem transitioned. And so love it. And then my grandparents started to decline. And so with my grandparents, they had an attorney and George was their attorney for years. George was their attorney. They called him anytime they had a problem. They called George. George told them what to do. George only did wills. So here I am, you know, fresh out of law school thinking I'm all that and then some. Uh, I dropped all their power of attorneys and I take them to the house and I'm sitting at the kitchen table with them and and uh, my grandfather, uh, I said, look, guys, you know, George did your wills, but he didn't do all these other documents. I just want you to read them. I'll change any names or, you know, that you want in there. But tell me, you know, just kind of go through them. I'll, I'll talk to you about him, whatever. And he slid him across the table and said, I'm not signing that. And he stomped off. And then, of course, my grandmother looks at me and says, uh, give me a pop. I won't sign him. I can't sign him either. And uh, and my grandmother uh, continued to decline. She became totally incapacitated, never signed her documents. My grandfather was taking care of her and he had his first stroke. And so during all this time, I'm on the phone with Social Security because he's writing massive amounts of medical bills. And I'm thinking, why do you have all these medical bills? You've got your own Medicare. You shouldn't have all these medical bills. So we started pulling stuff. When my grandfather retired to take care of her, he cobred his health insurance. 18 months later, he forgot to do anything else, and he didn't put her on Part B, so we're getting all these big medical bills. So I'm on the phone with Social Security, and uh, so I'm on the phone with, you know, you name it. I've, I've made massive calls, you, you know, trying to fix things and take care of them and learning by the seat of my pants. Let me tell you, it wasn't pretty back then, <laughs> and uh, so, but when he had his first stroke, I'm sitting beside him in the hospital bed explaining to him that I'm the granddaughter in the overall scheme of things, without him signing those documents, I don't get to make those decisions. You know, it's, you know, it was my mom and her two sisters. And I told, you know, I basically told people, I gave him his come to Jesus speech. I said, listen here, old man, let me tell you how this, how this works today. You know, so, and uh, he politely told me in a not nice way to go home and get his documents. And um, he got all his signed and thank God, you know, so for that, you know, so when they both passed away, because they passed away about nine months from each other. And um, and I realized as I started seeing more clients that there was a lot of seniors that didn't have anything good. Uh, they might have just had wills and nothing else, you know. And so it really became a mission to, you know, to educate as many people as we could. Because I didn't want people to be like my grandparents, to have longtime attorneys that weren't giving them good advice 
or weren't giving them good documents, you know, and so, and a lot of estate planning attorneys will draft documents, but they don't help seniors in the elder law because there's so much more we have to do. And uh, so, you know, for them, it's just a matter, it's a mission, uh, definitely a purpose. It's a way to honor my grandparents and um, make sure that somebody else doesn't have to go through what I went through. <laughs> yeah, that that's, thank you for telling that story, because I think that can really help people bring it home. This is a topic when I talk to my clients, people, people don't see estate planning as something they need to get right on. It's, it's, they, they know it's important, but they don't see it as urgent. And so things that are not urgent, well, we just put them off and we keep putting them off. And so I think people can really connect to real life stories. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and, and you may want to talk about this later, but I just want to make sure we, we discuss it. When I ask people to talk to their parents and find out what planning their parents have done, often I hear from them, oh, you know, it's not time yet. My parents are in good health. It's not that time. It's it's an awkward conversation. It's not time yet. And then I've I've seen things, and I know you've seen things, where what are you waiting for it to be time? At that point, it's too late, right? Because you isn't it true that you can't, with a power of, an, of attorney uh, form, they have to sign that when they're of sound mind, right? Or it's not right. valid. So do you want right. to talk a little bit about that, what you would say to, oh, it's not time yet? We tell every client when they walk into the office, I don't care if they're 18 heading off to college and we're doing all their power attorneys for their parents, um, you know, or they're, you know, I've got a 96 year old client, I think, getting close to getting to be 100. And um, so the range for us, it doesn't matter what what age. We start all of our clients planning for long-term care at the very beginning. Because what happens is, is there in 2019, we had to do a crisis Medicaid planning, guardianship for a 39-year-old and a 41-year-old in the same year. Accident, heart attack, minor children. I mean, crisis planning is ugly. I tell clients, you get pretty much one option in a crisis plan, and it's not pretty. But if you plan early, you have options, and every client should want options. They should want to have the ability to say, you know, I did some asset protection, and I have all the good things in place, but I really like where, you know, my spouse is or my mom or dad or grandparents, so we're just going to keep private paying, and I'm good with that. And I tell clients that all the time. I'm like, you don't need to do anything different um, for me as far as the choices that you make, but I do want you to have options so you can make those choices. Because when you don't, you might be, you know, spending all the money and the spouse at home may not have any. We talk all the time about going broke in the nursing home, you know, so we always want to make sure that even though people don't realize that Medicaid is an option, we want them to plan as if they were going to use Medicaid. Because right now, Medicaid is the number one payer for long-term care in this country. And so it pays over 60 to 70% of most long-term care. A lot of people, you know, more people I'm finding have long-term care insurance. But the reality is, is most people do not. They don't have any kind of long-term care insurance. And so, so really educating people about you got to plan and do something. Otherwise, you're going to be spending money. And so, and right now you're looking at six to $8,000 a month. So you know, that could wow. add, add all up, you know, depending on where you want to be. So it's hugely important that you start planning as early as possible. In all of our documents from 18 on up, they're all the same documents. They're all designed for our elder law clients. Everybody gets the exact same documents because we don't know when. We don't know when. Wait, did you say six to $8,000 a month? Yes, I did. <laughs> now, what can you, what, what is that? Is that long-term care without the insurance or what is that? Oh, that's private pay. You need to go, you need skilled nursing. You know, you might get a, you know, they might tell you, oh, room and, you know, room and board is like 4,500, but most skilled nursing, you know, you pay pharmacy, you pay the supplies on top of that. And their pharmacy is not your CVS or Walgreens, you know, so you're, you're paying a lot more. Uh, if you're using memory care, you're paying somewhere between seven and 10 up to 12 sometimes, depending on where you're at, you know, so planning for this kind of stuff is crucial because we want to make sure that, that you have the options that you want, that if it's a particular facility, then that you would like to have, then you plan for that. 
Um, I've even encouraged clients just go visit a few, you know, the continuum care as well, you know, to where you, you're fine and then you need assisted living and then maybe you need memory care because there's a lot of those popping up as well, but you want options. So I guess it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, that this can really mess up somebody's estate plan, their retirement plan. Would you say that long-term care is a huge risk for for a retirement plan? And if not, what is? Oh, I do think long-term care is your biggest threat to to your retirement. And so because most people, you know, a lot of people, it's funny because they say, I'm never going to a nursing home. And that's great. We hope that doesn't occur. Um, But the reality is, is that it's a lot, very expensive to stay at home. I mean, you're talking 20 to $25 an hour, which turns out to be like 20 to $25,000 a month for 24 hour care at home. It's just not feasible for the average consumer. You know, so the goal is to try to figure out what can you do. And in in our office, you know, we're really working towards helping clients figure that out early. Uh, We call it our elder care navigation. So we're working with clients, initial diagnosis, all the way through, you know, long-term care issues, because we want to make sure that they know what's out there. Maybe it's a personal care home, maybe it's something different, but they need to know what their options are so that they can have a good plan and they can put that plan in place and they get to make that decision while they're still confident to do so versus the family making decisions, you know, that maybe they don't want. And so, so for us, it's always better to to plan ahead as far in advance as possible. You know, and and people, people don't like to pay for long-term care insurance. I know I have a policy. I don't, I don't like paying for it. I have a, an annual premium that comes due. Nobody looks forward to that, but it sounds like what you're describing is so much worse than paying a premium for long-term care. So we advise a lot of clients and I'm sure Michelle, you have this as well, you know, to look at hybrid products, you know, things that while they're still healthy that they can get that can, you know, give you that bucket of long-term care, you know, and still, you know, not having to pay for something that, you know, people feel like long-term care insurance is like homeowner's insurance. You just pay and pay and pay and you don't get any results. But the reality is, is most people use them. And so this, the numbers are staggering. We tell everybody eight out of every 10 people are going to find themselves in a nursing home, even if it's just for rehabilitation after a hospital stay. We're getting older, but we're not necessarily aging well. So we have to plan for that. Yeah. And and I, uh, in my practice, we we work with hybrid policies and I, that those are so much more popular now than the traditional long-term care policies, but we I don't want to go off on a tangent. That's, okay. that's a whole another conversation, but yeah, very familiar with those. So can you talk a little bit about common misconceptions that you hear from, from clients? Uh, a lot of people think that, um, you know, that a will is enough that uh, they just need that. They don't need anything else. A lot of people assume that everything is going to go to their spouse. And a lot of times that couldn't be further from the truth. uh, Because the reality is if you're on second marriage, his and her kids, then the kids inherit without a plan. And so you might be, you know, you might be having, you know, owning half your house with the stepkids that may not like you at all. And so, because that happens a lot. You know, so the reality is, is that what you assume is going to happen for the most part is incorrect because a lot of people are getting bad information from their neighbors, the people down the street, their, you know, the hairdresser, you know, uh, the bartender, wherever they're getting their, you know, their information. But in a lot of it's just not good information. So, you know, we do lots of informational type things because we want people to get good information. Here's another one, Michelle. Uh, people assume that uh, because you're a community property state that you don't have to probate when one spouse passes. Couldn't be further from the truth because you still have to take that one half of the spouse to give it to the other. And so, you know, so there's a lot of myths out there, a lot of myths like Medicaid will take your home. Medicaid doesn't want your home. They want money. You know, so if you're on Medicaid, we want you to avoid probate, but we can do all those things to protect you because Medicaid only comes back as a creditor in probate. A lot of people think it's just a lien on the entire state. Not true. Uh, So as long as you avoid probate, Medicaid can never get paid back. And so those are the rules. We just follow the rules. And um, just like an accountant does with taxes, we just follow the rules and just help clients try to navigate that system the best we can. So so how how do you fix that that problem you described where you have 
husband and wife, community property state, like you, you can't, you can't just let that pass to the, it doesn't pass. So I, I, I guess the, the solutions are probably a little more complex for the scope of, of this episode, but is, are you going to talk a little bit about what you can do about that? So we do a lot of trust planning in my office because we have a lot of clients on second marriages, his, hers, and kids, his, hers, and our kids, um, and really trying to make sure that we don't disinherit children because will-based planning uh, is the fastest way to disinherit children when you've got his and hers. You know, so we tell clients, you, you're not on same marriage, same kids. You can't, you should never do will-based planning. And so, um, yeah, so I, call, I like to, I call it accidentally disinheriting your children. Absolutely. Now I tell people, <laughs> if that's what you want, great. But if not, then we need to put a better plan in place. You can also use life estate deeds. And I say that very carefully. There are ladybird deeds is the nickname out there in life estate deeds. Do not use transfer on death deeds that you get the form from somebody because creditors can get to that for up to two years. Title insurance company won't, um, won't give you title insurance till two years after that person has passed. I don't know what our legislators thought, but you know we had a good thing in place and they thought they were doing something and didn't get any good advice. And so they, they probably, probably messed up a lot of families that, didn't, that trusted the system that um, that didn't see an attorney and just downloaded that form and filled it out and and they're going to have problems down the road we can fix that just so you know <laughs> and so we've done that we fixed a lot of those things uh, to make sure that it passes the way we need it to and that creditors aren't an issue yeah so this this is probably not an area where people should do it themselves i i, I see a lot of do-it-yourselfers and you know with the internet and and all the things you can find on the internet but it's that one little thing you didn't know because you just didn't know it's not your field and it can just mess it up. Is that what you're seeing too, Kim? We see that a lot. And, um, the, you know, the lawyers will tell people all the time, you know, I'll put my law degree against Google law anytime, you know, so, and, uh, just cause you Google, it doesn't make it true. The internet is full of false information, Oh sure. Good, you know, but, um, there's a lot of things that are, are incorrect when it comes to Texas specific law. And that's what you have to focus on is what can we do here in Texas and so, or whatever state they live in, right? Or whatever state they live in. Absolutely. So can you talk about what kind of person needs a more comprehensive estate plan than just a will? So it kind of falls into categories. So let's talk about, let's talk about when you're young, newly married husband and wife. Wills, power of attorneys, perfect. When they start to have children, we want them to do trust planning because we want to make sure that all those beneficiary designations fall into the bucket they get to control. So as people, you know, have minor kids, as you have, you get older and you find out that maybe your kids aren't as good as you thought they were. Maybe they're not good with money. They have issues. Uh, I have That never kids. happens, right? Yeah. I tell everybody, anytime you have three or more children, there's always one that's not as good as the other two. So and, and nobody has ever contradicted me on that one. So we all laugh. I think that's just real funny. And, uh, but as you, you know, as you get older, you know, your kids may be adults, but maybe they're not good with money or better yet, maybe you don't like who they married. So we can put a plan in place to make sure that's, we call them the outlaws, make sure the outlaws don't inherit. And so, you know, so there are a lot of cool things we can do. And then as you get older, you know, you want to be thinking about maybe you need asset protection. Maybe you need to be protecting those non-retirement assets from long-term care if you don't have long-term care insurance. So we kind of walk you through the gamut of, you know, you kind of start off simple. You need to upgrade a little bit and maybe you need to upgrade a little more as you get older. And our process in our office is to visit with you every three years. You may or may not need an update to your big, you know, will or a trust, but your power of attorneys need to be updated every three years. You know, I tell clients all the time for for legal terms, that power, statutory power of attorney is ancient after about three years and financial institutions won't take them. Kim, I wanted to come back to one thing that you had mentioned about um, keeping the outlaws out. Does that also mean <laughs> that you have to um, keep your child out that's married to the outlaw? Not necessarily. And um, so a lot of times we'll leave it in trust. And so that so that it stays in trust, we call them a lifetime asset protection trust. It protects that child against predators, creditors, divorce themselves, you know, so it's a great tool that comes in, in our revocable living trust. So you can do lots and lots of good planning with one document and control and can control a lot of things um, okay. because I, you know, I tell people all the time, I have trust 
Um, I, <laughs> I tell clients all the time, I said, I'm going to die. I said, my kids are going to bury me. I said, they're going to read my trust. They're going to dig me up, slap me around a little bit. And if I'm really lucky, put me back in the ground. And, um, and so, because I did all kind of fun things because I know my kids. You know, so, <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, what I leave them gets spent the way I want it spent, you know, so I did what we could commonly call a, lo a whole lot of dead hand control. And, uh, and I have a lot of clients just like me. So we have a whole lot of fun with this. Very interesting. So, and, and I don't, I don't know if all attorneys are alike, you know, I think there's a common misconception out there that, oh, as long as I have an attorney, you know, even if they don't specialize in estate planning or, or, you know, it, they can take care of it for me. Um, I, that's not what I see come across my desk. I, I'm, I am no attorney, but I, I actually saw a trust that was only four pages long and something told me something's not right here. Um, can you can you comment just a little bit about that? Well, that should probably scare you. And, it did. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> because the reality is that, you know, there's, as attorneys, you know, we're trained to be able to do whatever we want to do. But to do something very well, you have to get your training out of law school. Because law school only prepares you to think. It prepares you to to, to spot issues, it prepares you to, you know, to know the things that you need to know in the basics of the law to get, you know, pass that darn bar exam. But the reality is, if you're going to specialize in something, there's a lot you have to do. I mean, I take over uh, sometimes 30 to 50 hours a year for CLE for all the different practice areas that I do, because I want to make sure that my clients are getting the best that they can get. And so, because I want to make sure that that everything is covered, that they're good, uh, we tell clients, you know, for for me, our trusts are a lot longer, um, because we put lots of things in there to make sure that even if they haven't thought about something, I already have. And so, so there's lots of built-in contingencies in our trust that we use. And so, for me, that makes a better, well-rounded plan. Now, you can see, I've had um, I've had an attorney give me, you know, do a one-page special needs trust. Um, I, I couldn't do it myself, but, um, but they said, you know, all you need are these elements, you know, but I'm like, you know, but you're missing some other things that we want in our trust to, you know, to make it better. And so I, I don't think that all attorneys are created equal. I think the problem is, is a consumer doesn't know how to pick a good one. Oh, sure. And, and the laws keep changing too, just to make your job a little, a little harder. Every two years for the last eight to 10 years, the legislators have been in Austin playing with the statutory durable power of attorney every two years for, for ages now, medical power of attorney. Uh, they make them different. They make them effective on different dates. Like how, stu how stupid is that? You know, so, <laughs> you know, so it's just, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, they're just, they're lacking some, I think sometimes a little common sense, uh, but still, no, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, you know, so you want to just, you just have to, you know, you just have to do the best you can, you know, in sure. that aspect of it. And so, you know, really having personal referrals, I think is good. And so, um, but you were talking earlier, one of the reviews we got, Michelle, you'll have to read it, uh, go to Google My Business and read it because it's so funny because the woman posted, you know, estate planning is not the foremost of what they think about. It's crime and, you know, food on the table and other things. And I thought, oh, bless her heart. You know, she's just the sweetest thing, you know, but the reality is, is people put estate planning at the bottom of the list when it should be at the top. They do. They do. It's in, and so in my practice, I am, I'm, I'm the nudge. I'm the one that's always nudging people. Okay. It's time. It's time. I follow up, follow up, follow up because I, I really feel like no one else is going to do that for them. And, and we don't want something terrible to happen before they finally uh, wake up. And that brings me to the last question I have for you before we wrap up. Can you talk about what would happen if someone does not have any estate planning in place? I think people need to really understand this because, because they, then it will become more important to them to get this done. So let's just talk about death. I tell clients all the time, if you have someone you love, you plan because we want to make sure that you don't leave them a mess. And if you don't like anybody, you know, when you pass away, do nothing. It's the last knife you can stick in their back because it is painful. These kids are crying in my office. Can't believe mom and dad didn't do the things they needed to do. Why did they leave this mess, in, you know, in place? 
the reality is, is in estate planning, things don't pass the way you think they do because our laws were written years ago and they've never been updated in the sense of one marriage, same kids. And so in you, you know, we all know that, you know, 50% of marriages, you know, end in divorce. So then people remarry. And so then they have more children, you know, so yeah. our laws don't protect those people. And those are a lot of people out there that need things in place. Your worst case scenario is incapacity, because if you become incapacitated and you have old documents, you have no documents in place, then you're in probate court under a guardianship. Guardianship's expensive. I tell clients, hey, if you want me to make a lot of money off of you, feel free to do nothing and just make sure your kids have my business cards all over the house. Because How much is a guardianship? If you don't, you're, can you give somebody? Mm -hmm. Minimum, just guardian of the person in my office is $4,000. You'll spend about for guardianship of the person in the estate. You need temporary guardianship possibly because you need to do something quick. You'll spend about 7,500 to 10 grand the first year. Everything you want to do, you have to, we as an attorney have to file and ask permission from the probate court. So people get hammered <laughs> and, uh, and legal fees because, you know, there's just so much that we have to do. You have to request something as simple like a monthly allowance and you can only spend this much money. And if you spend any more than that, you're in trouble, you know, so there's lots of things that come into play, but it's very expensive. Then you got to file annual accountings when you're guardian of the estate every year. I make a lot more money that way too. And I tell clients all the time, I don't want to make money that way because that's not a good plan. I would just assume you come in and do your estate plan, get your good, powerful power of attorneys, get them updated frequently so that you don't have to do this because the cost is a lot minimal than guardianship. So there's, there's nothing pretty about not having a plan in place. Nothing. Well, and, and I like to say everyone has an estate plan. Everyone, it's either yours that you wrote or it's written by the state of Texas, what they want for you. Oh, even worse, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam and the state of Texas or whatever state you're, you live in, right? Yes, so you're going to have an estate plan, just either the one you wrote or the one they write for you. That's correct. And it's not pretty. <laughs> well, listen, Kim, thank you for helping us understand some of these very important issues that we like to put on the back burner and not think about because it reminds us of our own mortality and nobody likes to think about that. We really appreciate your coming on today and, and talking about some of these things. How can people get in touch with you? So you can go to our website, which is yourlegacylegalcare.com. Uh, you can schedule off the website as well. Um, we have lots of, uh, under our resources in our virtual library, you can watch all our workshops. Or you can call the office at 281-218-0880, and we're happy to... Um, to get you scheduled and get you in. And uh, we have offices around the city, a couple of them. And um, so we can get you in almost anywhere. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you, uh, Kim. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, how can people get in touch with you? So they can call at 713-589-6448. Or if you don't have a pen, you don't want to write that down, just visit the website, Gessner Wealth Strategies. Dot com. Well, thank you for joining us today. Please like, follow, and share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for listening to Retire to a Life You Love with Michelle Gessner from Gessner Wealth Strategies. We hope you were inspired to take steps to your financial freedom as you learned new techniques and strategies for managing your finances. To learn more about how you can improve your financial landscape, Visit our website at www.gessnerwealthstrategies.com. That's G E S S N E R wealthstrategies.com. Or give Michelle and her team a call at 713 589 6448. And don't forget to click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes are available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Michelle Gessner or Gessner Wealth Strategies. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.